Hi, I'm Michael. I had a pretty normal childhood growing up. Mom, two sisters, chores. Now, the chore that I hated the most was shoveling. Man, I hated it. The lugging, the shoveling, the pushing. Did I mention I grew up in Buffalo, by the way? Now, a task that would normally take me 10 minutes would end up taking me about 40 minutes or an hour because I'd actually just go outside and play in the snow. My mom would always explain, it doesn't matter how long you're out there, the work still needs to get done. You have to do the work. You see, my mom would explain that a time spent attempting a task does not equate to actual accomplishments or effort. I think about my mom's words a lot, particularly in what she would feel about where we are as America in terms of our racial journey. I think she would agree that even given everything we saw, we're still just playing in the snow. I also think about the events of the murder of George Floyd, and every time my heart breaks. You, you see, the weight on his neck is the same weight experienced by so many black and brown people in America and corporate America. Our voices are discredited, and our opinions are muted. So when I think about this, this period right, time, right now in America is America's first 1%. It's the first 1% on a path towards meaningful racial disentanglement. We're just starting. Yeah, I went there. I know what you're thinking. Another TEDx talk about race and racism. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's be honest with each other. You don't really care. My blackness is an issue with you. You're probably mentally disengaging right now. So why am I here? You brought me here. You see, in the summer of 2020, we saw a remarkable wave and changes happening across America. We saw people willing to have hard conversations for the very first time. I even saw Black Lives Matter blaze over the NFL. I thought for sure I was dreaming. You see, what you didn't see was the conversations your black and brown employees and colleagues were having. Had you saw those texts, those tweets, those memes, you would have seen a universal skepticism for this period and process. Let me be clear. Let me direct who I'm talking to. I'm not here to label anyone a racist. On the contrary, I'm here to speak to the ones who view themselves not as a racist, the good guys, my self-appointed allies. I'm talking to the person who I'm sure as you sit here today can convince yourself that you're one of the exceptions. You may have posted a black square. You may even protest it last summer. Some might even say, I marched with Dr. King. You may have worked in such and such city with such and such urban people. I'll be honest, I don't really care about your diversity training or the books you've read. You do not get to decide when we are past racism. Better yet, I'll let you know. I'll slide you a DM and tell you that we've reached the post-racial society. I won't attempt to distill the world down into a 15-minute discussion. But I do believe, as a member of corporate America, it's best that I frame my conversation within that context. So, let's start with two simple facts. First, only 5% of the full-time students at Villanova are black. And there are only four Fortune 500 black CEOs. Now, while you may see these as separate issues and facts, I don't. I see them as the same thread tied at separate ends. The way we move past this is in steps. First 
is to recognize the past. Second is to decolonize. And then thirdly is to focus on the future. Until we recognize the past, there's no room for meaningful growth. We must avail ourselves to hearing different things in order to knock down some walls. You claim to be the good guys, but I have seen nothing of the such. I have not seen you willing to have hard conversations about the past. I haven't seen you say that America was built on pain, that we enslaved black people and tortured the First Nation people. The idea that your country, this country was built by your forefathers alone is completely wrong and almost a crime. Black and brown people helped build this country in every corner of America. It wasn't just isolated. Speaking personally of my black history, black history isn't isolated to slavery or the civil rights movement. We didn't disappear between those two periods. Truly recognizing the past is realizing that American history ran from coast to coast and not just the original 13 colonies. That's recognizing the past. You know, speaking of the colonies, that is step two, decolonization. Decolonization is the process by which we create a world that is more inclusive for more people. Decolonization is also the process where the standard of the American imagery is no longer a white face. Let's think about it. Rosie the Riveter, white. Uncle Sam, white. Lady Liberty, rust the green, but also white. Let's think about myself in corporate America. Every time I interview, I interview in front of people who don't look like me. I'm then managed and I report to people who don't look like me. Frankly speaking, all my bosses have been white. So when we think about the changes that need to happen, particularly at the colonized mindset, we must ask ourselves, how do we recruit? Who does the recruiting? What internal bias language are used? What is the promotional rate of black and brown employees versus whites? How much money is being spent on diversity initiatives? You see, not knowing these answers is not good enough anymore. Not after you said you'll stand and fight for me. You know the work that needs to be done, but instead, all I get is black and brown people adding into a commercial or two. Decolonization asks that you have the hard questions. The next step, focusing on the future. The future is broad, it's unknown, so it's best that we look at it in context. First, to my parents in the room, I challenge you today, after we're done, to go into your child's room, crouch down by the bookcase, look at the video games, and see what images are being placed in front of your child. Now, let's think back to the classroom, even at this university. What is the ratio of black and brown faces sitting next to you in your classrooms? You see, those in the classroom are our future CEOs and business leaders. Speaking of, the accounting industry, for example, is commonly plagued by this identity that is for the middle class, upper whites, particularly white men. You see, of all the new hires by CPA firms, only about three to 5% of those were black. This is in, in spite of hard work by the AICPA trying to bring diversity into every step of the process. The home, the school, the environment, these are the pieces that build towards a better future. This is where we focus on the future, right here and now. Let me finish. I'll be honest. The mirror of America 
is closer to that of Jesse James than Abe Lincoln. And every morning, we brush our teeth with American lies. America was never noble. America was built on self-interest and pillaging. America wasn't the great nation on the, on the hill. We were built off of rebellion and individualism. This idea that your country was built by your forefathers alone is a dangerous narrative. I understand this might be exhausting. Trust me, I know. I never wanted to be the diversity guy. I wanted to be a damn good consultant, sell some work and retire early, 55. So when you leave here today, when you say, oh, that young man, he had some good points, and then go about your normal life, because I can't, my blackness does not allow me to do that. Or will you have the hard conversations and go to your bosses, your community, and ask for the answers? If not, I'll still be here. And the person after me will be here. And the person after me will be here. We'll still stay at this first 1% for America until we stop having pleasantries and have real conversations. If not, we're still just playing in the snow. <laughs>